is phrased, what is the point of the Trinity? Let's be clear, Christians did not invent the Trinity for any purpose at all. Christians believe in the Trinity because the scriptures don't give us any choice but to believe in the Trinity. It wasn't invented for a purpose or a point and we don't embrace the Trinity because it's more reasonable than a unipersonal God. No, we believe in the Trinity because the apostolic teaching gives us no choice but to believe in the Trinity. And we believe in the Trinity because the Bible teaches it. If you believe in a unipersonal God, then you don't believe in the God of the Bible. So say you. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Do you want to debate it? Do you know what Do you want to debate it? Do you know what dogma means? I don't know Aquinas' definition. Wait, let me finish. You asked the question, let me answer. You asked me, do I stand by Aquinas' definition? I don't know it, so I can't stand on it. However, in terms of my understanding of the distinction between the persons, it's in connection to their hypostatic property. That the Son is begotten of the Father and the Spirit is spirated of the Father. In other words, and the Father is uncaused. And so, when you die, my the three persons of the Trinity, again. sharing the divine attributes that are no linked death. to the concept there of divinity, no life after have death. hypostatic Why? attributes life that are unique and, death death. and thus when you die, you persons, that's such it. as their economy in the actions of God. That is, for instance, that God commands that man should be saved. Jesus redeems man through his death and resurrection. And that the Spirit sanctifies. The one act of salvation is not complete until all three persons have performed their various acts. Their various acts form the one action of the divine. It's called the economia. Are you and within that economia, we make distinctions. No I understand that. I've read on the economy. It's all about money and the distinction. But only if you are winning. But I'm drawing your question and pushing up all the fight. Anyway. Yeah. He believes that a person is a substance with a rational nature. Okay. So this means that, for example, you, why you wearing the black bush on it? Bob. Bob. My name is Shane. where one can be three and three can be one. Here's an example. We're standing in three-dimensional space. We have the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. Each axis has exactly the same attributes. So that if you rotate them, they behave and are exactly the same, despite their rotation. We stand in three-dimensional space, but we experience it as one thing. Here's another example of how three can be one and one can be three. The triple point of water, where water under certain pressures and certain temperatures takes on exactly at the same time the attributes of solid, gas and liquid 
at the same moment. These are examples of how three can be one and one can be three. If, now, the, the way to understand it is to recognize that you're not counting the same thing twice. When we say God is one, we're talking about God's essence, the thing that makes God God. When we say God is three, we're counting God's person, the thing that makes the, the thing that makes each of the persons what, their person. What is your favorite dream? And this, I've already Hello. said, the the, def, the the distinction that I'm going to defend is the distinction of their economy within the action and their uh, their um, hypostatic attributes. That's the distinction, the personhood that I'm going to defend. And I don't understand that completely, and that's why I'm calling into question that theology. Because you didn't, you, what, what you have gotcha. from God, because there's one essence. So guess what, guys? There's one human being. There isn't 20 human beings here. There's one, because there's one essence. That's human being. It's humanity. Just like there's one God, it's their essence. That's what makes them all God. But you still have three distinct persons. There's still 20 I different people. I don't want to fucking go to so heaven with you when I die. Sorted out the when you call into the three axes that you're talking Satan. about, when it comes into the dimensions, guess what? You said that they're identical to each other. That's not three distinct persons that are not each other. That is actually, guess what? You may not know it, you fall into modalism. If you don't fall into modalism, guess what? You fall into tribalism, as I've already demonstrated. Three distinct persons, not each other, not identical, only identical in essence. Look. Three distinct persons, me, Shay, Bob, and this brother right here. Three distinct persons, one essence, humanity. So what? There's one human, just like there's one God, one essence, that's God. That makes no sense. Shane, where, where are you coming from spiritually? What's your background? Are I'm, you, are I'm you a Christian, I'm a Muslim. I'm a Christian. I'm a dynamic one. Okay. So let's be clear. Shane confused language. I don't know if you picked up on it. He said that there's one, two, three persons, and then he said there's one human. That was a misuse of language. In terms of the species, we are all one species because we are all human. So we belong to the species humanity. But in terms of our personhood, we're three persons. And Shane confused the language because I don't know if you picked up on it, I did. He went, we, there's more, there's three persons, so there's only one human. That's an irrational statement. If there are three persons, there are three humans, but there's only one species, humanity, that is shared by us all. Now, in terms of the divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is only one species, the species of divinity. And there are three persons that have that species, that possess that species. The Father possesses it, the Son possesses it, and the Holy Spirit possesses it. The best thing you can do, guy, brother, 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 the best thing you can do is ignore the deranged man. Just close ranks, form a shield, and ignore the deranged man. He's feeding on your energy. All right. Now, in terms of species, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit only have one species, divinity, and they all have it. But I want to be clear, their possession of it is in a way different from our possession of common humanity. And I want to use a crude analogy, a crude analogy to demonstrate how it is different from how we share in humanity. How the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are one in essence, it's like saying myself, Shane and this brother all shared in the same atoms, nuons and electrons at the exact same moment in time. In other words, that we were exactly the same material at the same time. Now that unity is what is taught by Christianity. The analogy is crude, but I hope you understand that how we share in one species is different from how God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit share in one species. Actually not. You proved my point. I was going to listen to what he said. Divinity, humanity, they're synonymous when we deal with terms because they're, the, they're both categories.
reason which being skilled or possessed. So guess what? You have three persons that are identified with divinity and you have three humans or three persons that are human beings that exist in humanity. You don't just have one God now or one human being. You have three human beings. You have three gods. This is why I said we were using tritheism or modalism. Now, let's prove it even further. He tried to say that we would have to share in the same atoms. Not true. Because that's what substance is there for. When we say there's three distinct substances, three distinct persons. This is why we don't have to be the same atoms and we don't have to share the same substance when we deal with um, individuality. So I'll give you I'll give you three definitions. Definition one, essence. Definition of essence is the attributes that make something or someone what it is. So we're all human. That's the definition of essence. Then we have the definition of substance. The definition of substance is the attributes that make a, a individual or something or someone an individual. So I'm not you, he's not me, you're not me. Guess what? When they say Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they call in no question. That make something or someone an individual, not each other. Right? Can I reply? That's why it's part of the Can I reply? Okay, you correct. Let me finish up here and I'll give you a reply. When we get to essence now, this is what he's calling one God. He, he wants to forget about the three distinctions which makes them three separate persons of each other, not each other. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or not each other. He wants to forget that and then harp on it's one God because there's one essence. That's logic, logically not sound. I can say, if we take his example, I can say for humans, oh, we're one human now. We're one human. Do you know why we're one human? Because we all share the same essence. Even though we're different substances, even though we're different substances, different people. That's what he's calling into question. That's what he's calling into question. That's what he's calling into question. So Shane would do better in this argument if he didn't actually characterize me and actually listen to what I said. Because once again, he's ignored what I said and repeated the same error again. Firstly, I said that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit were one in essence. And I'm happy to work with his definition of essence. It's the thing that makes you what you are. We have attributes that make us human and therefore we all share in the essence of, did I say human? No, humanity. So in other words, Humanity is distinct from human. They are linked. One is built on the other. Every human is part of humanity because they have the attributes. But each human is distinct. This is what we are saying about the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that they all share in the attributes of divinity. They are divine but they are distinct as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Shane, for some reason, tried to suggest that I had eliminated the distinction. No, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if Shane believes in the Bible. He hasn't said well what he believes in terms of scripture, but we can demonstrate that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are all God. And so I'm going to ask Shane Firstly, to tell me, please, which of these statements he disagrees with. And for the sake of clarity, I'll ask you one at a time until you tell me that you disagree with one. And then I propose we debate that, okay? Do you believe that there is only one God? Yes. Do you believe that the Father is that God? Yes. Do you believe that the Son is that God? Right. So this is what we're now going to debate whether the Bible teaches that Jesus is God. Fair? So, you go first. Tell us why Jesus is not God. According to Acts chapter 2, Peter is speaking. If we're going to take anyone from any words from anyone, it should be Peter because he is the head of the church. He's the chief cornerstone. So let's read what he says. Acts chapter 2. Let's see if he says he's God. But let's see if he says he's a human being or man. Can I suggest we do one passage at a time? No problem. Yeah, no problem. This is Acts chapter 2, 
verses 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So, God's doing these things through a man, not that this man is God, according to Peter. That's Acts 2. Acts 2.22. Okay, so he's brought in Acts 2.22. Put your hand up if you're a Christian. Keep your hand up if you believe that Jesus was fully man. So in other words, Peter saying that Jesus was a man accords with what we believe. Christians believe that Jesus was fully man. But do we believe that Jesus was only a man? So I agree with Peter in Acts 2, 22, without dispute. The man Jesus performed wonders on behalf of God the Father. But in Titus chapter 2, verses 13, it says this. Looking for the blessed hope, and the appearance of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Christ Jesus. So my question to Shane is very simple. According to Titus chapter 2 verse 14, who is being called God? I believe in Titus chapter 2 verse 14, the one being called God is the Father because when you read verses 1, it tells you. Now let's do the context research. If we go to Titus, and I'm going to read it, chapter 1. Guys, guys, you guys, honestly, trust me, just form a shield and ignore him. He's feeding on the fact that you're giving him attention. I agree. So this is Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. So we can get the quote, quote, I would call in this case prologue, or the main teaching of what is going to be stated in verses 5 from now, which he says, Pete, uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accorded with, with great godliness. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching which I have seen have been entrusted by the command of God, our Saviour. Now this is where you've got to listen carefully. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. So when you read the scripture, you have to know who he's calling God and who he's calling the Saviour in the context before you read the rest of the scripture. This is why when you read the next part in verse 14, it says God and Jesus Christ our Saviour. And if you understand what and is used there to demonstrate, is to demonstrate a distinction. It's not saying and this person is God. No, it's saying God is there and the person Jesus is there. That's all it's doing. And we know that because of verses 4. Now, I want to ask him about Peter again. Can you show me from Peter's own mouth or his own teaching where he ever calls Jesus God? He ever said Jesus is God? He ever says that you should believe he's God? Go ahead. Right, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to answer his question very directly. But I first want to comment on his counter-argument. And then I want to introduce another passage. So, in answer to his question, and I can find this if he wants to dispute it, but the Greek is clear and indisputable that in Titus, the one being called God and Saviour is, is Jesus Christ. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, scholars construct a grammatical rule from that very passage about Greek grammar that demonstrates that the passage is talking about Jesus Christ. And I'm happy to return to that if he wants to dispute it. 
but the passage very clearly states our God and Saviour Jesus Christ and the grammatical rule is that both of those titles are connected to Jesus. Now he asked a fair question, where does Peter say that Jesus is God? I will show him. I believe it's in 2 Peter. Give me a second to find it, bro. What version of the Bible you need to So. Just a question. What version of the Bible? Right. King James, Vulgate, Hexagon. King, listen, he asked, where does Peter call God in his own words? Okay. In 2 Peter, chapter 1, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. So there Peter calls Jesus Christ God. I've answered his question. No. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Now ladies and gentlemen let me introduce another passage Oh no, sorry, we said one passage each, and I've introduced second Peter, so I'll come back to my next passage. Okay, so again, he's made the same mistake he made with Titus, which is not reading uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the writer of every single book will designate who God is, which he done in Titus 1, he designated God in Titus 1, is God the Father. Titus 1 and 1, if anyone wants to go and read it again. Now we're going to do this in the book of Peter. He designates who God is again. He keeps on harping on the fact that he says God and Saviour Jesus Christ. He forgets the word and. And. It's like saying John and Sam. Is John now Sam? No. Two distinct people. And is being used there as a distinctive term. So now this is how we're meant to read the Bible. If we go to 1 Peter. Now let's go there. Verses 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the knowledge of God, the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied upon you. So what the problem is, is when people read the Bible, they don't understand the relevant context in which the writers are calling this person God and the other person which is and or with. Because again, Greek, the word is chi in the Greek and it's just a conjunction. It's just with and so it doesn't mean that this is now the same person, identical, and it's now calling him God. I can show you many places where this happens with human beings. Now are you going to call Peter Satan? Get behind these Satan? What's Peter Satan now? That makes no sense. Peter's not Satan. So there's a relevant context on how you have to understand these passages. Go ahead. Okay, let me introduce my passage and then we'll go ahead. I want to get... Um, Second Peter chapter three verses. We're not having good reception. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm getting crap reception. Yeah, I'm getting crap reception too. Has anyone got fast Wi-Fi? I need it. Because um, I'm about to hammer him with some academics on the Greek that he doesn't know about. But I can't do it without bloody Wi-Fi. Um, can, can you just, can you pull up netbible.org for us? Netbible.org And if you could, could go okay. to... Right, go on, get, bro. Yeah, this yeah. So this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses... For there is one God, listen carefully, this is the perfect demonstration, there's one God, let's see who he, who he says this one God is, this is Timothy 
taught by who, correct? Who was taught by who? Christ himself. Christ himself came to Paul and was teaching him. So let's see what this person says, the one God is. Let's see if it says it's the three persons or if it's one person. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Jesus Christ. So is, is the man Jesus Christ the God who mediates between man? Or is he someone else different from that God? I'll give you another example. Wait, 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 Can wait, wait. Jesus, no, it's the, same, it's the same thing. Can Jesus be the mediator of someone else for someone else, but be the same person that he's, he's mediating to? Can he do that? Or is that a logical Right, can I reply? Go ahead. Right, ladies and gentlemen, while my slow Wi-Fi pulls up the notes that I want to read, I just want to point out to him that Christians don't teach that Jesus Christ is the Father. We're not teaching that Jesus Christ is the mediator to himself. The brother doesn't understand the Trinity. He's arguing against the cartoon characterization of the Trinity. If you're gonna argue against a straw man, you're going to lose the debate. Christians do believe that Jesus Christ is fully man. And so, as the second person of the Trinity, who is fully man, priest in the order of Melchizedek, he is our one mediator to the Father. That's one person mediating to another person. That works, ladies and gentlemen. His argument fails. And I've shown you two passages that very clearly, in black and white, say that Jesus is God and Saviour and he wants to argue that you should take God and apply it to the Father and you take Saviour and apply it to the Son but ladies and gentlemen that ignores what the word and means if I say that you or a human and a man that is different from me saying you are a human and a man but then saying that the word man refers to someone else if you say that Jesus Christ is God and Savior both of those titles go to Jesus you can't use the and to talk about someone else that is not in the same clause of the sentence. That is not how language works. No one would say that I am speaking to an ignorant heretic, Shane, that by that statement I meant that Shane was ignorant, but someone else was a heretic. The word heretic and ignorant was both applied to shame by the word and. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read from Acts 20, verse 28, and I'm going to ask Shane to answer a simple question. Do you mind if I ask a question first? Who died for the sins of the church? Shout it to the back. I believe Jesus did. Did what? He died. He was shed, his blood was shed on the cross. For who? For the sinners of this world. Right, listen. You all heard Shane's good confession. Did you hear Shane's good confession? Yeah. Yes. Now listen to Acts 20 verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock amongst which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So here's my question to Shane. Who purchased the church with his own blood? Because Acts 28 says God did. So again, and it probably won't be in your translation because this is what English translators do from the Greek from time to time. But I can give you relevant manuscripts what, it, what this is in but they miss out the sun, and I can read it for you. 
So in Acts uh, 2028, 20, in the... Please say New Living Translation. New, new World Translation. In the contemporary English version, All right. it says, Look afterward, after yourself, sorry, and every everyone the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be like shepherds to God's church. It is the flock he has brought with the blood of his own son. So in certain translations, it will miss out his own son. In the translation he read, it missed out completely. It just says his own blood. It's actually meant to say his own son's blood. Or in some translations, his son's blood. I can give up many translations that say this. So that one was the contemporary English version. Another one would be the Good news translation, I'll read that one too. So keep what's over yourselves and over the flock which the, which the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be shepherds of God, of the church of God, which he has made, sorry, which he, has, which he made his, his own through the blood of his son. So he made it his own through the blood of his son. That was the good news translation. And there's many more, and you can look at the Greek Translation issue to be quite fair. Can I can I come back? Go ahead. Right, ladies and gentlemen, he quoted two translations that are both paraphrases. Though the, the good news translation is written for people whose first language is not English. It's not a word-for-word -word translation. And the contemporary English translation is not word-for-word -word translation, and that's why you should be aware of whether you're quoting a paraphrase or a word-for-word -word translation. I would ask Shane to actually answer the question I asked him. In Acts 20, verse 28, it says that God purchased the church by his blood. He argued, he argued, oh, depends which translation you read. We will go to the Greek, I have it here, and I will ask him to show me in the Greek which Greek manuscripts say what he said, but I want to return to the issue of 2 Timothy, 2 Titus, verse 13, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to read from Dr. Bart Ehrman, Doc, no, sorry, Dr. Daniel Wallace. Dr. Daniel Wallace is a Greek textual scholar. He reads the Greek like you read the English and he's aware of all the textual variants. And on the issue of 2 Titus 13, he says this. The term God and Saviour both refer to the same person, Jesus Christ. This is one of the clearest statements in the New Testament concerning the deity of Christ. The construction in Greek is known as the Granville Sharp Rule, named after the English philanthropist, linguist, first clearly articulated the rule in 1798. In what year? 1798. Sharp pointed out that in the construction, the article noun chi, where chi and two nouns are singular, personal and common, i.e. not proper names, they always have the same reference. Illustrations such as the friend and brother, the God and father, etc. abound in the New Testament to prove Sharp's point. So in other words, scholars attest to the fact that 2 Titus 13, both titles, God and Saviour, were references to Jesus Christ, not Jesus and the Father, as Shane tried to argue. So now, this is what I mean by New Age scholarship. He just brought out a person called Granville, if I may be saying his name correctly. Granville and a, Sharp. And a, and a rule that he came up with, 1780, what was it? I wrote it down. In 1798. So before 1798, people that were reading the Greek text didn't have this Greek rule. He didn't have this Greek grammatical rule that he's bringing up. So if this Greek grammatical rule comes into existence in 1998, sorry, 1798. 
1798, please forgive me. You're telling me the Christians before 1798 didn't know how to read um, Titus chapter 1 verse, sorry, that Titus chapter 2 verses 13? God forbid, the people before 1789 knew how to read that Greek text without the Granville Sharp rule. How do you think they read it, sir? Do you think they read it with the Granville Sharp rule? Do you want me to answer? You don't have to answer it. No, I do. The Granville oh, Sharp I really rule. do. No, okay, watch this. Peter didn't have the Granville Sharp rule. How did Peter interpret that text? Simple as. I'll show you how he interpreted that, te that text. I'll give you an example where they make Kai. I said it in the beginning, the Greek word there is Kai. It shows distinction in person. It shows that the title is not placed upon one. He will tell you that you are wrong. You're here, a man who is studying Greek grammar, doesn't know Greek grammar, isn't a scholar of Greek grammar, and there are two scholars, one that you can talk to today, Dr. Daniel Wallace from Texas, uh, uh, the Seminary of Texas, and they will both tell you that you're wrong. Have some humility, Shane. You don't know as much as you think you do. No problem. I can go to someone like Dale Tuggy, who studies Greek grammar and is an expert in Greek grammar, and he The necessity is the norms and the functions and the forms of the Greek language. The, the Granville Sharp rule comes from the text itself. It comes from how those texts, how the Greek constructs a sentence. Not just in the New Testament, but outside the New Testament as well. This is equivalent to arguing about some English grammar rule and saying that English grammar rules were invented because they're trying to prove a doctrine. No, they come from how people normally use the language. That's where the Granville Sharp rule comes from. The problem is Shane doesn't want to admit that his argument on Titus 2.13 is sunk by academics. Show me a translation that ascribes the term God to the Father and the term Saviour to the Son. Show me where some translation does that, because they don't. They all ascribe them to the Son. Now, I want to come to Acts 2, 28, because Shane made a valid point. But I want to point something out to Shane. Shane made a valid point, and he's going to demonstrate that the same academic that he's now arguing with agrees with him. But he's going to accept it when the academic agrees with him and argue with him when the academic doesn't. Whereas I'm being consistent. I'm agreeing with the academic when he agrees with me and I'm agreeing with the academic when he agrees with Shane. So ask yourself which one of us is being more consistent. Here's what Dr. Daniel Wallace says about tw Acts 20 verse 28. All with his own blood with the blood of his own, the genitive construction could be taken in two ways. As an attributative genitive, second attributative position, meaning his own blood. In other words, God shed his own blood for the church. Or, or as a possessive genitive, with the blood of his own son. Now, when Greek grammar works in Shane's favour, he'll be happy to agree with it. When it doesn't work in his favour, he argues that we don't know Greek grammar. But, ladies and gentlemen, either translation of the Greek works with Christian theology. Because if it says God shed his blood for the church, then that means Jesus is God. Both 
both of them work within Christian theology, but only one of them works in Shane's theology, not both. So either way the grammar works for us, but only one way does the grammar work for Shane. So he is driven by ideology to choose one way of interpretation over the other. He's God. Because if you read the whole passage, firstly, the Father glorifies the Son. Did you all hear that? The Father glorifies the Son. He lit. The Father worships the Son, in other words. And in 17.3, Jesus says that the Father is the only true God. We Christians believe that. No problem. But in 17.5 of John, Jesus said, Now glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the foundations of the world. So in other words, Jesus is claiming divine glory and pre-existence before the world was. How can that be anything other than divine? To have divine glory before creation itself. In other words, he went to the wrong passage. The passage supports Jesus' divinity, not the fact that Jesus is not divine. And Shane consistently fails to see two points. I'll remind him of both. We Christians believe that Jesus is a man. So just pointing out that Jesus is a man doesn't disprove that he is also God. And secondly, Christians believe that the Son is not the Father. So pointing out that the Son is not the Father doesn't disprove our belief. 
Janey trying to argue against doctrines I don't hold, whilst ignoring the doctrines that I claim. Now let me ask Shane a question. If Jesus is not God, why does he have divine glory before the world was? Because it was promised to him, according to Ephesians chapter 1, and I can read it. So I interrupted him Just because he wanted to lie on me. Notice so he's complaining. You know, I'm really not complaining. Notice he's complaining. He, he said, he said what's Notice our, he's is complaining. Not, Hebrews, that's why I want to know. No, no, because Hebrews has nothing to do with John. It's the same theme theological theme. The it's the Bible. Th yeah, thank no, you. Yes, it's the, the, the Bible, which is our authority. And John 20, which talks about the Do you like being I don't mind. Where are you coming from? So shall we go back to not No, no, you interrupt. Right, so we'll just go interrupt. We'll just go interrupt. Because the reason why because John 14 and John 20, you can, you can continue interrupting. I will, I will. Okay. At leisure. So John 14 and John 20, you know, it says that you have to believe in something. Uh, yes. That's Correct. what we're talking about. And what do and we that believe? believe? That he who is that sees he the Father is, who sees the, is father, the one who sees the, the Son. And in Hebrews, and it when you says that, that Jesus is the exact image of the Father. The and that's the exact image about. of the Father. In John chapter, in so John that chapter, is in why John 20, 20 is, no is linked to Hebrews chapter 1. Three. I don't know why you're confining yourself to John. Because it doesn't so, work to quote Hebrews no, chapter 1. No, no. The, fun, the funny thing proves, is, the funny thing is, because he knows that Hebrews chapter 1 works and demonstrates that John chapter 1 should be interpreted from a Trinitarian perspective. I'm trying to tell you. And the reason why... Trying to tell them and you interrupt. Yeah, and you lied on me. Yeah. You, 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 you just said that you, you, you said that I said it was a blasphemy. You said that I said it was a blasphemy. And I demonstrated why it's a blasphemy. And you lied. And I demonstrated. No, I gave an argument. I never lied. What was the argument? You lied. What was the argument? You said I said something. What was the argument? Listen. What was the argument? You lied. What was the argument? You said I said argument. What was the argument? And that's why I told you you lied. And you're upset that I lied. Trinitarian like Shane and be a Christian? The answer to that question is no. It's impossible to be a Christian and not believe in the Trinity. I demonstrate to Shane where the scriptures clearly state that Jesus is God in black and white. I demonstrated 
that those verses were backed up by the interpretation of academics of the Greek grammar. I demonstrated, and I was even willing to concede, when Shane made a valid point. But the problem with Shane is that he was a little overexcited and he didn't accept the fact that his, his defense of Thomas's words is to put blasphemy into Thomas's mouth. And he just took his jokes and toyed out the pram. A Christian, by definition, glorifies Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To deny Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means that you are not a Christian. Bro, you ask, want to ask a question. The what? Yeah, what you mean the second coming? The fall of the temple. Okay, so I'm dealing with his question. So there's a passage in scripture that, if read wrongly, could suggest that Christ is returning before the second temple. It's talking about when Christ talks about the end of the age. And his, second, and his return. And some people read that in a way that tries to suggest that Christ is coming before the destruction of the temple. All Christians reject that view. The re the, what Christ is talking about, when he talks about the, the, the he will come again in glory, he's talking about a prophecy in Daniel 7. As Daniel said, and I continued to look into the night watchers, and behold, one like the Son of Man was presented before the Ancient of Days and seated at his right hand. Christ, after the resurrection, which is before the destruction of the temple, ascends and is glorified and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That is the coming again in glory that Jesus is talking about. However, separately to that, the New Testament talks about the parousia of the Lord, which is the second coming of the Lord, where Christ will come again. Evil parable, you know. I, just trying to teach him man of shame. So I interrupted him. Just trying to teach him man of shame. Notice he's complaining. I'm really not complaining. Notice he's complaining. He, he said, he said what? Notice he's complaining. Not Hebrews, that's why I want to know. No, no, because Hebrews has nothing to do with John. It's the same theological theme. The Bible. Th it thank you. Yes, it's the Bible, which is our authority. And John 20. Do you not believe in Hebrews? Do you like the Hebrews? I don't mind. Where are you coming from? So shall we go back to not No, no. You interrupt. Right, so we'll just. Interrupt. So, so interrupt. Because the reason why is because John 14 and John 20, you can, you can continue interrupting. I will, I will. Okay. At leisure. So John 14 and John 20, you know, it says that you have to believe in something. Uh, yes. That's Correct. what we're talking about. And what do and we that believe? believe? That he who sees the Father is the one who sees the Son. Is the one who sees the Son. And in right. Hebrews, and it when you says that, that Jesus is the exact image of the Father. And that's the exact image about. of the Father. John chapter, so John that chapter is why John 20 is, no is linked to Hebrews chapter 1. Three. I don't know why you're confining yourself to John. Because it doesn't so work to quote Hebrews no, chapter 1. No, no. The, the, the funny thing is, why the funny thing thing is, thing is because he knows is, that Hebrews chapter one, one, 1 works and, and demonstrates it's it's that it's John it's chapter it's 1 should be interpreted from a Trinitarian perspective. And the reason why trying to tell them and you just said that you said that I said it was a blasphemy. You said that I demonstrated why it was a blasphemy. And you lied. And I demonstrated. No, I gave an argument. What was the argument? You lied because I never said that. What was the argument? What was the argument? What was the argument? Listen. What was the argument? You lied. What was the argument? You said what was the argument? What was the argument? And that's why I told you you lied. What was the argument? And you're upset that I lied. And that's
Trinitarian like Shane and be a Christian? The answer to that question is no. It's impossible to be a Christian and not believe in the Trinity. I demonstrate to Shane where the scriptures clearly state that Jesus is God in black and white. I demonstrated that those verses were backed up by the interpretation of academics of the Greek grammar. I demonstrated, and I was even willing to concede when Shane made a valid point. But the problem with Shane is that he was a little overexcited and he didn't accept the fact that his, his defense of Thomas's words is to put blasphemy into Thomas's mouth. And he just took his jokes and toyed out of the pram. A Christian, by definition, glorifies Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To deny Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means that you are not a Christian. Bro, you ask, want to ask a question. The what? You mean the second coming? The fall of the temple. Okay, so I'm dealing with his question. So there's a passage in scripture that, if read wrongly, could suggest that Christ is returning before the second temple. It's talking about when Christ talks about the end of the age and his second and his return. And some people read that in a way that tries to suggest that Christ is coming before the destruction of the temple. All Christians reject that view. The re the 